You're listening to CX Passport, the show about creating great customer experiences with a dash of travel talk. Each episode, we'll talk with our guests about great CX, travel, and just like the best journeys, explore new directions we never anticipated. I'm your host, Rick Denton. I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport. Let's get going. Mm, There is nothing quite like the smell of fresh bread. Something about that stirs up memories of home and family. It just makes me smile. And if you happen to be from Austin, Texas, where I grew up in the 80s, you may even remember elementary class field trips to the Buttercrust Bakery on Airport Boulevard. I still remember barely paying any attention to, to the tour, only desperately hoping for the end when we were finally given a piece of that glorious bread coming right off the line. I imagine some of you, right now, feel like you can taste great bread just by me mentioning it here. It's hard for a brand to create that same sensation, but there's just something about Kings of Wine that creates that same brand love with customers. That's why I'm so excited today to talk with Troy Figgins, head of customer insights for Kings of Wine. Now, listeners, I know some of you will say, Rick, customer consumer insights? That's not customer experience. Aha, perhaps true and pure definition, but it's those consumer insights that help understand, inform, and create the insights that help a company know how to create a great customer experience. When there's as much love for a brand as there is with Kings Hawaiian, clearly they've got a pulse on their customers and are delivering delight in the experience. And yes, I am throwing some love to the brand today, but full disclosure, there's no promotion here. Just excited to hear a story from a great person at a great brand. What I also know about Troy's and Kings Hawaiian story is this is a story about how a brand can really grow customer understandings from the basics into a mature insights approach. And folks, It's got Hawaii built right into the brand. Of course, we'll talk travel. Troy, welcome to CX Passport. Hey, Rick. Thanks for having me. I know this uh, kind of bounced around a little. I'm glad we were able to find some time. No kidding. I'm I'm glad that it is finally here. I'm also glad, full disclosure, that I've already eaten lunch because I would be so hungry having this conversation. So thankfully, you will not hear stomach grumbly noises during the the recording here. But (laughs) let's start with that journey that we were talking about. Kings Hawaiian is a brand that evokes these images of mom and pop bakery in view of these crashing waves on a Hawaiian beach with consumer insights simply limited to the conversations that they have at the sales counter. I know that's clearly not where you are today. So tell me about that journey. Actually, Rick, that's a pretty accurate description of how the company got started. Oh, right. it did. Excellent. <laughs> you know, it's a seven-year-old bakery started in uh, in in Hilo, Hawaii, on the Big Island, uh, by our current CEO, Mark Tyra's dad, Robert Tyra, and Robert Tyra was a baker by trade, and um, you know, besides just making great bread. Uh, his kind of overarching goal for why he started this business was to give people a place to gather, you know, to, uh, give them a, give them a place where they could come in and kind of talk story as he would describe it. Um, and, you know, one of his sort of guiding principles was treating everybody that came in with aloha. Um, mm-hmm. and that sort of attitude has sort of permeated everything that King's Wine has done. And, then, and it is truly a family affair. Um, like I said, Robert was the founder, kind of the patriarch of the, the company. Mark, his son, is our, our CEO. Mark actually grew up uh, in the original bakery. He oh, really? jokes about uh, taking naps on bags of flour and stuff <laughs> like that. So it, it definitely comes from humble roots, um, but, uh, but it's come a long way since then. And, and that's just amazing to think that it started there, although you said something in there that triggered a thought, and it was you know, a place that folks can gather. So it was almost as if they had the customer at the forefront, probably before they were even thinking about, oh, customer. It was just, hey, let's let's gather around here. Have you felt that sort of heritage of uh, focused on the customer, even if they didn't know the label, sort of weave throughout the brand and its history? Definitely. I mean, we, we're a CPG brand, which is consumer packaged goods. So you know, our customers are actually the grocery stores of the world, the Walmarts and the, and the Kroger's. Uh, we refer to the end user, if you will, as a consumer. So they are the people okay. who actually buy it from Kroger and bring it home for their families. Um, but that focus on both customer service and being, you know, good, uh, good partners for our consumers too, um, 
it sort of weaves through through both of those. And and I mentioned that like the um, you know the company started humble, but it has grown. It it's become a big sort of national brand. Hopefully, a lot of people are familiar with King's Wine and have enjoyed King's Wine. But it's it's just experienced incredible growth over the last let's say ten years. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is due to this just you know, maniacal focus on delivering both the needs of our, of our customers, the grocery stores of the world and the needs of our consumers, the people who are actually making a delicious sandwich or hamburger bun or, or a slider yeah. from our products. Well, let's, let's actually talk about that, that idea of the promise. And, and what's making me smile a little bit is my current client has nothing to do with CPG, right? It's in the insurance and even the reinsurance industry. And I was telling someone there that I was going to be able to talk to you and talk to someone from Kings Hawaiian and the biggest grin showed up on their face just by saying that. So clearly, and, and she said she could no longer talk about anything. She just wanted to talk about bread from there on <laughs> out. So I at least know that there'll be uh, somebody very excited about this episode coming out. But it's clear there's a brand promise there. There's something that Kings Hawaiian has said, this is who our brand is, this is what we are. And we hear a ton about that inside that customer or consumer experience world and outside of it. It's, it's vital, right? That's the brand promise is vital, that delivery. How did you discover your brand promise? How did that come about? That's a great, great question. And then that experience is not a unique experience. I mean, then we hear that from just about everybody. There's a, there's a ton of, uh, you know, passion for the brand. It's a, it's a powerful brand. People feel very passionate about the brand. It's, there's a lot of love around the brand. Um, we're very fortunate in that people either love King's Wine or they like King's Wine. There's very few people who <laughs> dislike King's right. Wine. So we're, all, we're, we're on the good end of the scale there. Um, and it's not surprising, right? Because if you think about, I mean, first we're a food, so like we are a part of food-related occasions, which are just generally nice occasions um, to be part of. And then we generally are part of uh, bigger occasions like Thanksgivings mm -hmm. or you know people getting together for dinner or, or things where you're gathered around with the people you care about. So there's a lot of you know, just wonderful kind of emotion that are that's tied into those experiences. Um, when it comes to like the brand promise, uh, you know, for us, really, and we did a lot of work on figuring out our kind of brand pyramid and you know what we deliver, both in terms of functional and emotional benefits. Um, and really, our our brand promise is is delivering happiness. I know that's sort oh. of a big. That's that is sort of a big. Yeah. Um, area to play in, right? It's, yeah. it's, pre it's pretty huge. Uh, um, but when we've actually measured ourselves against other brands, especially other bread brands, uh, consumers consistently deliver us 10 points over the competition in terms of delivering happiness. There is some magic to this brand in terms of, of delivering that happiness. And when we drill down to our kind of corner of happiness, because happiness is very broad, it was more about getting together about belonging definitely about togetherness occasions um that we help foster these sort of togetherness occasions um and a lot of the it sounds like a lot to deliver for a, you know a humble bread brand but yeah. um the fact that we are sort of universally beloved by everyone we are we are a crowd pleasing product and brand and that sort of universal love it just makes it makes people feel very confident that when they roll out the king's wine no pun intended when they bring it out <laughs> like the, it's going to make everybody happy and so um you know we're again we're just in a very fortunate place that like we want to make you know we want to foster more togetherness occasions we want to make people happy and people feel very confident that we are the brand that can deliver that happiness this is your captain speaking. I want to thank you for listening to CX Passport today. We've now reached our cruising altitude, so I'll turn that seatbelt sign off. While you're getting comfortable, hit that follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Love if you'd tell a friend about CX Passport. Leave a review so others can discover the show as well. Now sit back and enjoy the rest of the episode. And and I've got to imagine, so happiness being such a central theme to that brand promise, 
it's it's almost you know you can see you can see me i know it'll be an audio podcast but it's almost kind of this esoteric happiness so how does that go from that kind of uh, i'm imagining these thought bubbles and clouds and and visions into actual tactical decisions and the consumer insights that you create how do how do you go from insight to ultimately delivering happiness what does that look like that's a great question right um the uh just us knowing us being able to identify the happiness and you know our corner of happiness this togetherness uh sort of superpower if you will um was really eye-opening for us we all kind of knew it and i mean like family has kind of known it for a long time you mentioned like somebody telling you when you mentioned king's wine and that they just love the brand and and we, we have tons of um anecdotal mm. sort of you know, observations of people, you know, people stop me in the airport when I'm wearing a King Swan backpack and they're like, <laughs> I love King Swan. So is there anything in there? there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So we knew there was like something special there, but really doing the work um, to, you know, do the research and find out and verify, sort of validate what it is about King's Wine, you know, what it is about our functional benefits that ladder to kind of those, you know, functional or sorry, our functional attributes to ladder to those functional benefits that then sort of ladder to those emotional benefits. When we really sort of like drilled down on that and, you know, quite frankly, validated. So not like it showed us something new. It was more sort of validating what we already knew mm -hmm. um, that we do play a, a, a clear role in people's lives and delivering that. That was, like I said, that was just very eye opening for us, right? We were like, okay, great. Now we sort of know almost like what our, you know, mission is a little bit. And so we kind of even talked about like, gosh, you know, as a brand, we just, we feel like the world would be a better place, if you will, if more people got together more often with the people they care about, because there's just so much, you know, human benefit in getting together with the, the people you love over food. And we we're like, man, that's a great place for a brand to be. Like, why not? Why not be the, the brand that stands for getting together with the people you love? And it's not just a, you know, a timeless thing where obviously people have been getting together since there sure. have been people, but it seems very timely now. Yeah. Both you've got sort of the aftermath of sort of COVID of being very separate. And then there's a bit of sort of polarization going on in the world. Just in general, we find that families tell us they're just so busy. They don't have a chance to get together um, with the people they care about on a, on a regular basis, even their sort of immediate family. Um, and so we were like, boy, this just feels like a great place for the brand to be, to just continuously yeah. try and remind people at, at, a, at, a, in a, at the smallest way, like that it's good to get together with the people you love, but even more, like, can we give them the tools and the help and, you know, the things they need to sort of uh, help get together with the people they care about? So, you know, we have a campaign going on right now where we, we're sort of inventing a new occasion if you will that okay. we're calling slider sundays it's a it's a little All bit right. of our our quarter turn off of taco tuesdays sure. but uh king's wine is like it's a it's a product that's sort of perfect for making sliders and yeah. again sort of going back to consumer needs when we talked to our consumers they told us um you know the idea of getting together with their family having a reason to get together with yeah. their family a super easy convenient simple way to gather the family before the busyness of the week starts on a Sunday uh, was super appealing. And so we thought, all right, let's see if we can turn Slider Sunday into something. So we started with that insight of like togetherness and yeah. the need for people to be close, you know, be together with the people they care about. And it sort of turned into this very sort of tactical marketing program that we're Ooh. pushing forward. You keep here. I'm saying, ooh, yeah. I'm, I'm visualizing. I told you I had lunch, and but now you're actually somehow finding a way to make me hungry with the description of Slider Sunday. And I love how that ties into so many of the other things you're talking about. The togetherness. It's getting recharged before the week. It's your last little moment, kind of of respite before. And then, well, you know, here in the U.S. and also in you know other parts of the world, there's quite a sports influence in the afternoons of Sunday as well. So Slider Sunday certainly fits well with some good sports going on as well. I like that. I like that a lot. You know, I had no intention of asking you about anything pandemic related because we're all kind of sick of hearing about that but i'm curious if togetherness was such an important part of the brand and the brand promise 
what happened and how did y'all address that and that absence of togetherness during that period? It was, it was tough, right? Um, yeah. So COVID was sort of a, a plus and a minus for us as a business. It was a plus in that um, people were looking to the brands they felt comfortable mm, yeah. with, the, mm. the, a lot of sort of nostalgic brands, brands that um, brought them kind of more comfort, if you will. And so right. um, we, got a, we got a little bit of a lift out of that. So a lot of people who uh, maybe had not bought King's Wine in the past few years uh, decided it was a good time to sort of get the brand again. And so we got, we, we, I wouldn't say we got a lot of new households, but we sort of got a lot of, uh, we brought back a lot of households who might've, okay. you know, been gone for, for a little while. Um, so that was, that was super helpful because it gave us a bit of bigger kind of audience to talk to, um, from, a from a downside perspective. Yeah, man. I mean, we had like tons of marketing around getting together in your backyard with yeah. your neighborhood about, you know, having a barbecue and stuff like that. And that, that just was not, we actually, we did some ad testing because we had some ads teed up that were ready to go that sort of showcased that. And people were like, oh, this was, you know, summer of like 2020 people yeah. were like, yeah, that's, that does not feel like my life right now. Yeah. Um, and so we ended up quickly pivoting and moving towards, uh, you know, more, showing more people sort of at home with mm -hmm. their immediate family. Um, and stuff like that. So it, it did kind of like make us have to sort of pause for a little while. And I, what I would say is, I don't know, more of sort of our traditional big gathering marketing and kind of focus in on just like people, uh, um, the people that are at home. Um, but yeah, it's nice to come out of that now because I feel like Boy, people, no kidding. there was so much, there was so much pent up sort of demand for <laughs> getting together that now, since we are a brand that is about getting together, it's just a message that, you know, people are yeah. really, really happy to hear. I have to imagine that now coming out of it, but what a, what a smart pivot there in the middle of it. It just, you know, I had no intent of even talking about that, but it just made me think about that absence of togetherness and what do you do during that period? But now finally, right. We're, we're, we're seeing the increasing and increasing and increasing signs of that. That's now right. let's, let's go back to our happy place here. Uh, the, it's built into the brand's name Hawaiian, but I know they're not located there anymore. And I imagine, though, the islands, though, have still been somewhat influential to you. Have you had the chance to travel there? What are some of the experiences you've had in the Hawaiian islands? Yeah. So, uh, well, first I can talk about Hawaii with the brands. And so obviously the, the brand is from Hawaii. Like I said, it started in Hilo. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not just the fact that it was started in Hawaii, but the Tyra family has been very clear about wanting to sort of adopt Hawaiian culture and sort of, you know, principles into the way we do stuff. So okay. um, there is, there is this spirit of aloha that is sort of woven through um, kind of everything we do. And, and that Hawaiian heritage is really, it's sort of a nice place to be because it's all about kind of courtesy and respect and caring and treating each other well. It's about family. You know, we, we call our family the Ohana. Um, and it oh, is nice. like what we talked about before, like getting together and feeling welcomed. It's also um, a lot of Hawaii is a, a place where a lot of different cultures blend together. So there's a lot of blending together, which again kind of comes back to this spirit of togetherness. So even, you know, whether it's food or people or culture or whatever, it's very sort of like uh, blended together for me. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm, I've been lucky enough to have lived in Hawaii. I lived in Hawaii oh, for nice. four years, right out of college. I, I graduated from uh, West Point, so I had an army Wait. commitment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, After I that. got it. Okay, and, that's uh, how you got there. Okay. Yeah, so I was, I was lucky enough to get my first duty assignment. Duty, I guess if you want to say that, in uh, in Hawaii. Wow. Um, yeah, I had, to, I, had to, I had to watch over the beaches of Hawaii, but I was happy to do it. You yeah, know? sure. You served well. Thank you. Served well. Um but yeah, Hawaii, it's a, it's a truly just amazing, magical place. I mean, most people, I think, kind of know that if they, even if they haven't visited, and I would, I would highly recommend you know, everybody go visit, but um, it's obviously a beautiful place. Weather's great. Um, people are just incredibly welcoming and, and thoughtful. That Aloha spirit is real. Um, and then the food is, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. We talked about like, you know, cultural sort of blending Hawaii food is sort of a, you know, 
mashup of a whole bunch of different cuisines. Roy, Roy Yamaguchi is probably the best example. Mm-hmm. You know, that guy sort of pioneered fusion cuisine, mixing together sort of French and Californian and Asian uh, flavors all together. So, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Hawaii. Troy, I know it's a, it can be a long flight, even even from the West Coast, but you know, certainly if you're coming further, a long flight into Hawaii. And so sometimes it can be nice to stop down in the first class lounge. So let's have a little change of pace here. Join me here in the first class lounge. We will move quickly here and hopefully have some fun. Now, I, I don't know if this answer to this question is going to be Hawaii or not. It's okay if it is. But what is a dream travel location from your past? Oh, from my past. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to be in the first class lounge. It's, uh, it sort of reminds me of your... Uh, your baller suite in Hoboken. <laughs> That's right. We were talking about that, weren't we? Of all things, the words baller suite and Hoboken have not been uttered together all that often, but it really did exist a couple of weeks ago. Yes. But yes, Troy. Yes. Uh, favorite um, travel location from the past, I would say would have to be Japan. I was mm. lucky enough to go to Japan with a Japanese coworker um, that I worked with at the time, Dr. Mitsunori Ono. Uh, and I went to Japan to meet with some some vendors we were working with and, and he kind of took me around and showed me the true sort of the behind the scenes yes. Japan. If we, if we, if you will, we went to a couple of sort of just amazing classic behind the scenes, Japanese places. We went to a, a restaurant that only specialized in uni. So uh, wow. yeah. And so it had uni from all over the different islands of Japan, just huh. incredibly interesting and yeah. weird and delicious and <laughs> and then and at night we of course went to and did karaoke and so we went to a karaoke place that i could not get back to in a million years it was like down a few alleyways up into what looked like a nondescript sort of office building down a hallway to an <laughs> unmarked door <laughs> yeah. and, and, doctor are you yeah, planning to leave my body somewhere back in the back right. of this <laughs> yeah right <laughs> wow right. uh yes very fun what a spectacular experience. Yeah. So I don't know how you're going to top that, but what is a dream travel location you've not been to yet? Yeah. So on my short list, uh, I, I kind of want to go to Corsica. Um, huh. So yeah. So South of France, part yeah. of France um, islands, but it's got to be speaking of mashups of cultures and fusion, you know, Corsica is sort of this blending of French and Italian, but it's got it's they've got their own sort of culture as well. Yeah. They were sort of, you know, they've been conquered by a whole bunch of different um you know countries over the years, but they maintain sort of this weird independent, rebellious yeah. nature, even though they're part of France. And so I think that sort of you know weaves through again the food and the yes. attitudes and everything um from a from a topographical standpoint it's got like amazing huge mountains and uh, you know incredible beaches though it's not super populated so the roads are all these little two-lane roads that sort of you know circumvent the island so i think it'd be really fun to go there that would be fun i uh i always love it when a guest throws something new i've not had anyone say corsica before so that's fun now now it's got (laughs) you've got me you can googling after this more information about it that's right i like that Well, we've talked about food a lot. And so I'm going to tell you that King's Hawaiian is not allowed to be an answer to this question. But what is a favorite thing to eat? Uh, Other than King's Hawaiian. That's right. I know that would be the answer. I understand. So what is your second favorite thing to eat? It's it's so hard to pick one thing. I mean, we're coming off the 4th of July weekend. I'm not sure when this is airing, but we are, we're, you know, this, this week is just post 4th of July. So I got to go with the burger. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's like quintessentially american yeah. right um it's i for me i think it's like this perfect combination of opposites right you've got sort of the warm side and the cold side you've got that you know saltiness of sort of the meat and maybe Gosh. bitterness of sort of onions and the sweet of maybe some ketchup it's got it just has a sort of great sort of combination <laughs> of stuff um i mean gosh it's like can be very super simple all the way to incredibly yeah complicated gourmet so it's got a lot of range and i don't know it just never gets old it's just a, it's a, 
an amazing sort of combination of. I can tell I'm interviewing you because for listeners, I'm in the central USA time zone. Troy's out West. And so I've caught him before lunch. So uh, the way he describes that uh, just is so beautiful. And so, but I'm wondering how much of that is hunger inspired. It, it it certainly makes me want to go get a burger right now. Uh, How dare you? Well, let's, let's, let's try to counteract that. What is the thing your parents forced you to eat, but you hated as a kid? Oh gosh. Um, my parents were great. I mean, they really, my, for me and my sister, they they uh, had us try a lot of different mm-hmm. things. So we were and we were pretty adventurous eaters, you know, right off the bat. So we weren't picky at all. Um, we got to try a lot of things. I'd say the one thing that I don't I don't hate, but I just have I don't know maybe bad memories of is, uh, <laughs> you know when when we would go out to eat as the family. If the place, this is going to date myself a little bit, but if the place we went to had a salad bar, um, you know how on salad bars they always have those uh, pickled jalapenos. Oh, yeah. My dad yeah. would always challenge me to a oh, pickled no. jalapeno <laughs> eating contest. And so, uh, man, I, I even smell those things now. It just like <laughs> makes me sweat. I just, it's. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome, Troy. <laughs> You're talking to a Texan here, so I kind of I, I like my jalapenos Understood. and I like my Understood. spices, but but I love oh my gosh, I love the story, I love the visual of of young Troy oh. being challenged by Dad yes. Troy. That's yes. awesome. It was, it was it was like that scene in uh, Raiders oh. of the Lost Ark. We're just sitting across from each oh, other, right, right, you know, going. <laughs> oh, going I'm toe fun. to toe and eating jalapenos. Oh gosh. But, yeah. Well. Let's close out the first class lounge. What is one travel item, not including your phone, that you will not leave home without? Uh, well, let's see. I mean, I travel pretty light. I like to I like to just bring minimal amount of stuff. In fact, I just brought a travel backpack, um, which is very small. Uh, I did this so that I can fly on some of the discount airlines that don't hmm. allow you to have a carry right. on. So right. uh, it's going to just be my backpack. Um, I'd say the one thing that I that I always pack nonstop uh, is uh, a jacket that I have from Patagonia. That um, I love Patagonia as a brand, and this jacket is just from a functionality standpoint is amazing. I mean, it's good in cold weather, it's good in warm weather. Um, so no matter where I'm going, it feels like I'm always going to need that at, at at some point. And then it just rolls up to this tiny fraction of its uh, you know its unrolled size that. For someone like me who is trying to pack everything into a backpack, it's it's pretty great. Mine's not Patagonia, but I've got a jacket similar to that from REI that uh, it amazes me how it can be compacted from this wonderful warm. I, I went skiing in this jacket to something the size of a you know less than a burrito from Chipotle type thing. So right. it is amazing how these things can condense down. Let's get back into talking about consumer insights. So I know part of where you're getting insights now is listening to the customer, your digital community. You've even alluded to some insights that you've gathered from them, but I'm, I'm curious about that journey, right? It, when the brand started, the quote digital community was the people that walked into the store with the crashing waves on the beach. But from that to where you are today, I'm curious, how did you build that community? How did you, how do you listen to that community? And then how do you translate what you hear into business actions? Yeah, the our our digital online research community is one of the things we're we're most proud of building in the last couple of years. Um, we did mention that you know people are very passionate about King mm-hmm. Swine, so we didn't. It was actually pretty easy to sort of recruit people who were interested in helping out the brand. Um, we find that when we talk to our community, uh, they feel they feel very passionate, but they feel sort of a connection to the brand. They want to help shape where the yeah. brand is going and help the brand make good decisions. So. Uh, we get a lot of engagement, a lot of participation uh, from our community. Um, the way we built it, we actually we partnered with a, a technology vendor to build the platform itself. Okay. Um, and then we uh, we have a pretty sizable uh, email list. So that was sort of our first, um, you know, our first pool of people that we went to to try and uh, build up the community. But but like I said, it was it was fairly fairly easy we got a, i'd say we started with maybe 1500 people um who wanted to be part of it and it was not easy to join so you had to go through a pretty rigorous sort of onboarding process of oh, nice. we wanted to know all about you yeah. and you know how to use the products and stuff like that so it wasn't something you could just just sort of sign up for you had to go jump over some hurdles to, to mm-hmm. be part of it we had about 1500 to start 
Um, we've been doing recruiting events since then. So it's now about 4,000 people. Um, it tends to be a little biased, right? I mean, these are brand enthusiasts, right. so we don't get a lot of, uh, you know, just light buyers. They tend to be sort of, um, you know, brand lovers, if, if you will. Uh, but like I said, they're very engaged. They're, they really want to do right by the brand. And so we feel very confident in the research that we get out of this group, because if we're not making this group happy, then um, yeah. we're probably, probably off the mark. And so how do you then translate that? I know I hit you with three questions at the beginning, but it's so important to take what you heard and then go into action. So how do you, what are you doing with that, that volume of insights that are coming in? How do you then convert that to an actual business action or set of actions? Sure. Yeah. That's a, you know, um, my boss is always saying like, make sure that this is actionable. It can't just yeah. be sort of facts for facts sake. So um, I think a perfect example is for our TV ad testing. I mean, we, we do spend a lot of media dollars on TV. We need our TV to work as hard as it can for us. Um, we actually had our community over the course of about a year review all of our existing TV ads, everything we've ever made. We just took the entire library. We built a um, sort of a questionnaire module and had them review all of these ads. Um, and then we, crunched all that data to look at correlations of things, elements in the ads that drive things like sales and drive things like brand equity. Um, amazingly, there were a few things that bubbled up to the top. And the, the biggest one was around relevance. Like, are we, is this ad relevant to people in their lives? And we were like, okay, that's interesting. Let's dig yeah. deeper. So we went back to the community uh, had a lot of discussions about relevance and what drives relevance in TV ads to get to the sort of actionable. Once we knew the elements that drive relevance and it's all the stuff that you, it's not super surprising, but it's the stuff you would expect. It's like, you know, showcases a true sort of need that I have in my life. The food that you're showing is a solution to that. It's in a, an occasion I can relate to. It's something that I do all the time. Um, so we've taken that and packaged that up. And now when we brief our ad agencies on making new ads, we're like, look, obviously we want the ad to be entertaining and funny and all these other things, but it has to deliver on these elements yeah. or yeah. it's not going to, it's not going to work. Um, and so that's been just really super helpful in getting the best kind of TV creative we can out of our, uh, our agencies. That's awesome. Oh, and I like that. I like that direct tie. And I also like the circle back excuse me, there's a circle back that comes from that too of we heard something. Now we want to check it again with the community, then go back and now you can use it ongoing. Uh, that drive to action is something that I talk a lot about voice of the customer. And so here you are in Consumer Insights, but that drive to action is something that's missing in a lot of companies, not, not in what you're describing, but so often, okay, we listened. Yeah, great. So what? That does nothing for your business. So it's good to hear how that is directly tying to these business actions. All right. We are way over time. But I don't care. I'm going to go a little bit longer. But this is probably the last <laughs> question, Troy, that I'm going to ask you here. And it, it, we've been pouring a ton of praise into the brand. But there's a danger in being at the top, right? You talked about it. people are either really love us or just love us, right? So there's a risk of, <clears throat> dare I say it, becoming stale. Yes, I'm a dad. I can make bad dad jokes. And you made a joke about roles earlier. So I, I feel I'm in good company here. But in all seriousness, how do you understand your customers to be able to continue to delight them and keep that brand promise so strong in their minds? Yes. So we talked a lot about togetherness, right? Yeah. And that the brand, the brand sort of mission is to foster more of these togetherness occasions out there. Um, and one thing that we've realized is there are a lot of togetherness occasions. Like there, there are, many, many, um, they, it seems that they're kind of shrinking a little bit. So it's sort of going in the wrong direction. Um, and we have an opportunity to sort of help push that in the, in the right direction. What, what we've realized is there's so much work to be done. We have not even begun to scratch the surface in the ways that the brand can help, you know, foster more of these togetherness moments. Um, so, uh, there's, it doesn't feel like we're at the end of this journey. It feels like we're at the beginning of this journey nice. and there's so many things we can go do. Um, and every time we've talked to our consumers, whether it's through our online panel or otherwise, uh, 
consumers are very, they, like we said, they're very passionate about the brand. They're excited to see the brand stretch into new things, whether that's more occasions, it could be additional products. We are, you know, we have a small portfolio of bread products, but it is small. I mean, the amount of areas that, or the number of areas we could go into um, are almost sort of unlimited. Uh, consumers have given us a lot of permission to go into yeah. Um, other types of food, other types of occasions. So, like I said, I, it doesn't. It definitely doesn't feel like we're at the end. It feels like we are truly at the beginning of of this, um, you know, important mission for the brand. Man, what an energized place to be. That's awesome. That's awesome, Troy. Troy, we are, as I said, way over time. That's great, though. That's the beauty of a podcast. I can go as much time as we want, right? Um, but how, if folks wanted to know a little bit more about you, a little bit more about Kings Hawaii, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, for Kings of Wine, um, you know, our website's probably the best place to okay. learn a little bit more about the brand or follow us on social media. For me, same thing, at Troy Figgins on Twitter is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, yeah, if you have any awesome. questions about bread, aloha, togetherness, any <laughs> online research communities. <laughs> or the craziest karaoke bar in all of Tokyo <laughs> that yes. we can never ever find again. Troy, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I'll get all of that in the, the show notes, folks. You can just scroll down and see it. Don't even have to hit stop. I've enjoyed talking with you. You've made me hungry even post-lunch. Great to hear. And it was so fun to talk to a brand and, and just a, a person who's focused on happiness and togetherness. What a great place to be in. So, Troy, thank you for today's conversation. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us this week on CX Passport. Make sure to visit our website, cxpassport.com, where you can hit subscribe so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, you can check out the rest of the ex for cx website. If you're looking to get real about customer experience, ex for cx is available to help you increase revenue by starting to listen to your customers and create great experiences for every customer, every time. Thanks for listening to CX Passport and be sure to tune in for our next episode. Until next time, I'm Rick Denton, and I believe the best meals are served outside and require a passport.